Good morning. It's good to be back. Hope you all had a happy Thanksgiving. And um, I thank Margaret and Eddie for all the production that they do and for making sure everybody has handouts. Um, I know it's helpful if you let Margaret know you're coming uh, each week or she puts you on the permanent list so that she can have the right amount of handouts and she can put them in your boxes and things like that. So y'all keep doing what you're doing and keep Margaret in the loop and, uh, and she will keep us going like she has been. Um, we start a new topic today um, because we start a new season. We started the new season Sunday, Advent. And my approach to teaching this Advent is not so much to rehash all of the biblical themes through the lectionary. Um, we will dip into those, we will utilize those, um, but I'm trying to frame our perspective this Advent in terms of how to navigate the waters of Advent in the world that we live in right now. And you might say, well, every year that's what we do. Well, I think we have other years where we're more sentimental and we, uh, I know that I have in past years focused a lot on, you know, what did the prophets mean when they said this and what does the doom and destruction that Jesus talks about mean? And, um, but this Advent, I, I think is different. This 2020 has been different. Uh, Advent starts a new church year. And, um, and so I've put an enigmatic storm as my logo for this um, and called this class Advent Themes for Today. So in other words, I don't think we're going to go over the same old things that we do, that we usually do, but we may use those as the tools in building for ourselves what Advent 2020 looks like. So I did, you know me, I like to start at the beginning. So I did, so today's theme that we're taking up is watching. But before we get deep into watching, I did start with what is Advent? And maybe we just need to hear this every year. I remember learning it when I was in Lutheran catechism. <laughs> but um, first of all, it's a season during the church year which means, you know, it's made up. It's, it's not a biblical mandate or something like that. Um, it comes from the Latin um, advenir, to come to, an adventus, an arrival. So there is something coming, and it's coming toward us. And so the word, I think, was carefully chosen to launch the beginning of the church year and the anticipation of what is coming toward us, which we understand to be the Christ child, and we always expect to be the second coming of Jesus. Uh, the word is not only a Christian word. Um, it's used to talk about the arrival of anything. It sometimes signals uh, an anticipated event that is really important. Um, the advent of the computer. Somebody might write in a historical Piece. You know, the advent of the computer was 1960 when IBM did such and such. Um, we can use the word advent to describe the liturgical period up to Christmas in which we anticipate the ways that God breaks into the world in the person of Jesus. And in that regard, the focus, I think, is on the, um, the coming of not on the one who comes, um, which I think is an intentional design of those who invented the season of Advent. They wanted to focus on the ING, the coming toward us. Um, it also emphasizes Christ coming again. During the season, we will reflect on the readings for Christ to come again. And, and it takes a mindset to do that. Uh, because we can get really bogged down in discussions about will Jesus return or and, and that's not the question <laughs> Jesus is going to come again that is a scriptural promise uh, Advent helps us scratch our head and talk about when and how mm -hmm. Advent's also a time of preparation uh, to celebrate Advent is to acknowledge that something big and earth-shattering and life-transforming is coming and to prepare for it. Um, 
we have adopted children, and um, our first one, we were scheduled to pick him up from the hospital um, on a Sunday morning, and we um, waited until the Wednesday before he was born on Friday to set up the crib, and our friends were appalled, and then they wanted to shower us with gifts, and I was like, you know what, this is 20, no, this is 1999. <laughs> We can pick up a baby and go to Target and buy everything we need. We, we don't need to start now sewing diapers <laughs> and making a wardrobe for the child. And, and that was just a very, you know, we have a lot of traditions that are rooted in necessity. Um, most people like a little bit more time to prepare for their children to come. Um, I'm glad we waited until Wednesday to set up the crib and took nothing in because uh, we learned uh, an hour before we were supposed to pick him up that his birth mother had changed her mind and she would be taking him home. Three weeks later, two and a half weeks later, she changed her mind again and we brought him home. Um, another time, uh, I went to the wedding of some friends of ours and um, on November the 8th, they went on their honeymoon to Hawaii and when they came back on November the 16th, we had a third child. And they're like, is this how it works? <laughs> and uh, not usually, but we, we have, um, the preparation to bring a child into your home for adoption is very different. We had already had the child study to be approved for a third child before we got the call about the third child. So, so we did our preparation. It just didn't look like the standard baby preparation that other people do. And, and I'm telling you this so you can get in your mindset, what does preparation for Christmas uh, look like, particularly this year? Um, so in this preparation, there are some biblical themes that I like to make start with W like watching, waiting, weighing, and wondering. And those are gonna be the four topics for our four weeks together. Um, but we're preparing for the birth of Christ, we're preparing for Christ's anticipated coming in the fullness of time. And as we prepare, um, we need to remember that God's revelation in Jesus came not in the form of an earthquake or the skies opening up in a cataclysmic event, but God chose to come into the world, as we all do, to be born as a baby in the midst of a chaotic world. But we don't need to prepare to bring a baby into the home the way uh, modern humans do. Um, we, we need to reset our thinking about the preparation that we do. And so by our own standards, which I admit I value efficiency, uh, people value power moves, the birth of a child may appear to be a slow way to bring salvation to the world. But as humans, we understand the, the metaphor of preparing for a baby to arrive, and God might not have chosen the quick fix or the easy answer, but much like revealing through the covenant, God has certainly chose something that we as human beings understand, the anticipation of a baby. So Advent's a time of preparation. It's also a period of celebration. Um, I don't know if you'll do liturgical colors here or around your other churches, but purple has long been the color for Advent, which was also the color for Lent. A long, I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, they they, whoever they are who think these things up, the liturgical people, decided to make blue <laughs> the color for Advent to distinguish it from Lent because purple is that repentant color. And while there is some repentance involved in Advent, and, uh, and we hear that note sounded, um, Advent is really a time of celebration, and the blue for royalty uh, really makes that distinction versus purple. So the earthly incarnation of God demonstrates God's total commitment to the very core of humanity. If you put an asterisk by that sentence on page two, uh, you will understand why Advent is celebration. Why not celebrate? 
<laughs> there is a commitment on behalf of our Creator to the day-by-day -day routines and challenges, a commitment to humanity from the cradle to the grave and beyond. And that is worth celebrating, that God is all in. We celebrate not only the possibility of salvation coming in the form of a child, but also that God still comes to us today. It, it, it's not a once a year event. It's not a once every 2,000 years event. Uh, God is appearing uh, with us every day. And we should celebrate that not only during Advent, but all the time. Um, God comes to us through the work of the Holy Spirit. God comes to us through the gift of the Bible. And God comes to us through Holy Communion. Um, so we celebrate that each day God is making the ordinary extraordinary. And making the broken whole. And redeeming and restoring the past present and future and whatever they hold. Do you know what I mean by redeeming the past? Um, I, I think that's hard for us to grasp um, and you probably do know what I mean uh, but it's essential because so many people feel like something in their past or their family's past has somehow blocked their access to God or rendered their prayers ineffective or is going to keep them out of heaven, or whatever they think, it's a sense of guilt. And um, when I say God is redeeming the past and, and restoring the past, he doesn't change history. But whatever looks like it was terrible and wasteful and painful begins to have value in the present in God's hands. And that's what I call redeeming the past. Uh, we didn't all have wonderful yippy skippy childhoods. Some of us had painful ones. Not everybody has a, a picture perfect marriage. Some of us have terrible ones. The point is that whatever our human experience is, God is in the business of taking that history, those historical facts, and, and making something useful and beautiful out of them. And so I want to celebrate uh, that skill and that activity that God has for me. And Advent gives me an intentional time to do that if I'm not doing it all the time. So I'm on page three now. What are some ways that we prepare for Advent? Well, we decorate. There's a beautiful Chrismon tree right behind me. Um, I'm thinking from now on, I'm going to have a Christmas tree in my house. I just, I love the concept of it. I love the symbols. Um, but we, the decoration isn't just for a show place. It's not just for the children um, or to create a festive atmosphere. Um, these symbols have meaning. Um, the wreath, uh, the Advent wreath in here is behind that. If you're wondering where it is, I saw it. Um, but the wreath um, is evergreen. And that's a symbol of immortality, uh, life and growth, the everlasting love of God. The circle uh, of a wreath symbolizes unending and eternal, uh, the eternal nature of God, who was and is and always will be. The circle is a very good representative of that. And light is a symbol of God's presence. And candles um, spread light into the world, the, the, into the darkness. So that is one way we prepare for Advent, by decorating, or prepare during Advent. Confessing. From the early days of the church, Advent was a time of prayer and confession, thus the purple that they borrowed from Lent. Uh, recognizing that the inward preparation that we do is as important as any outward activity. And to confess is to ask the one who knows you from the inside out, to remove the barriers between you and the fullness of life that God intends for you. Um, there are various ways to confess. Uh, I have to admit that at some point in my life, uh, I just had a list of things that I had done wrong. <laughs> and I was weary, and I confessed, God, see the list. <laughs> so 
But you can name everything if you want to, that's cathartic. You can simply uh, make a confession that you're human. God doesn't need, it, it's not that God doesn't know what we have done and, and he needs the list so he can think about it. God knows everything we've done. Um, the confession is, is our acknowledgement before the one who has the power. Uh, it's our acknowledgement that we know that we have done uh, something that is not consistent with God's principles and values and the values that we espouse as Christian people. And prayer. Praying for the world, praying for the chaos and the confusion in which we live, working for ways to find uh, for people in the world to see and feel God's presence, for all who God created to have hearts that are prepared to welcome, um, and, and, and again, preparing to welcome the baby Jesus. I believe the baby Jesus was real, uh, but I believe that the baby Jesus serves us now as, as the metaphor for expectancy, and we need to prepare not only to welcome the baby Jesus, but the Lord and the King, King Jesus. Uh, the Christ, the anointed one of God. I also just left some bullet points there if you want to add your own thoughts about how we prepare uh, during Advent or prepare to be in the Advent season. I told you in our time together we're going to look at these themes of Advent, watching, waiting, weighing, and wondering. So we're going to watch for signs of the new life that will change the world. We're going to watch and interpret the signs that are coming we're going to wait to see what exactly will be revealed. Um, but with cell phones and instant messaging and drive through service and year-round produce, I mean, you know, I always got an orange in the toe of my stocking. Because my mom always got an orange in the toe of her stocking. Because her parents got oranges in the toes of their stocking. Because fruit was a um, scarce and valuable commodity. And um, we live in a, a, a world now where our children don't appreciate, or maybe your children do, but mine don't, don't appreciate that there was a time when you couldn't just buy every fruit you wanted year round and that everything, you didn't get clementines by the dozens and things like that. So, um, I mean, we need to, 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 to check ourselves in this waiting category, and that's what we'll do next week. Um, weighing. What do we weigh? I think we have to weigh our priorities. I think we have to weigh um, is how we're spending our time worthy, is what we're focusing on the right things. It's, it's that weighing that I think that is a, an important piece of Advent. Uh, we have to weigh what the signs mean. We have to weigh do we get all wrapped around the axle about something or do we appreciate the metaphorical part of it. Uh, the, the, this is a discernment process. And then we wonder. Um, there's a country music song. I'm a very, I'm a country music fan, but I'm not allowed to sing in microphones, according to my husband. I'm also not allowed to do imitations. But um, the country music song says, um, I hope you never lose your sense of wonder. And it, it, I think the, the song is about dancing. And when you get the chance to sit out or to dance, I hope you dance. And what a wonderful message. But I really focus on the, I hope you never lose your sense of wonder. Uh, wonder and curiosity and pondering uh, doesn't even have to be deep and philosophical, but it can be. And so that's, that'll be our last week together. So when Jesus was born, some people welcomed him, some people ignored him, and some rejected him. And that's still the experience in our culture today. Some people welcome Christ, some people ignore Christ, some people reject him. Um, but Jesus, that doesn't change Jesus' purpose. Jesus came to the earth to be our Savior. Uh, and he came to the earth to be the Savior of the world, not just the Savior of the Jews, not just the Savior of the newly created sect of Christianity. And so we watch for the signs of Christ's presence. We wait for the plans of God to come to fruition. We weigh the importance and the effects of the events, and we wonder at the ways of God what difference that will make in our lives. 
because even though this event happened 2,000 years ago, and even though every year we celebrate Advent and Christmas and Epiphany, um, every year it's going to make a different difference in our lives. Um, and I think they're more than themes. I think they are, these are active verbs. They're things that we need to do. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're skilled at these disciplines. And rather than being watchful and keeping an eye out for the signs, we just like to make appointments and set our clocks and be about our business and show up for the big event. Um, so, so I think these Advent activities are a spiritual discipline and they're not easy, but this is an invitation for you all this year to take it up. Um, and so what is Advent watching? Jesus says, watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Uh, that's from, um, now I'm confused, my 42s and my 24s might be reversed. But anyway, um, it's from the end of Matthew, I think, chapter 24. And I, I wanted to look at the whole chapter so we can see what it tells us about the activity of watching during the Advent season. And so I've reprinted it, I think it's 6, 7, and 8, oh, maybe even 9. It goes on to 9. Um, but you, you and I have been studying the Bible together, and we understand that it, you can just pull a verse out and understand what it means sometimes. But the best practice is always to look at the statement in the context of how the story or the narrative is developing. So this is what happens. Jesus left the temple and he was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to the temple buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now maybe they're used to Jesus saying wacko things every time he opens his mouth, but maybe they're not. <laughs> so, um, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, when the disciples came to him privately, tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, first word, watch. Watch out. That's a kind of warning. Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen. The end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, earthquakes in various places, and all these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear to deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Well, I don't know about the disciples, but I felt like he talked a lot and really didn't tell me anything, right? <laughs> so, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet, prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Do you see why Advent is this uh, prophetic time of doom and gloom? Uh, Jesus is almost speaking like the Old Testament prophets who uh, prophet's job isn't to foretell the future, it's to speak for God. And when a prophet says something and it happens, then they get credibility. So it looks like their job is to foretell the future. Um, 
I, I'm going to skip over uh, to page 8 on verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. So I'm just going to pause right here and say, if we're listening really carefully, we hear about all these signs. And, and these, you know, we're going to see the fig tree, so we know it's summer, so you're going to see this, so you know it's coming. But then Jesus appears to contradict himself because he says, it's going to be like the flood. One minute it wasn't there, and the next minute it was. Um, two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, I'm on verse 42, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, again, he picks up this theme of watch, but he's really trying to make a bigger rhetorical point, if you're following me, that when he uses the imageries of the servants, since you can't know, and since we can't accurately interpret the signs, even if they're in front of us, uh, you just need to be doing what you do every day. You can't wait till you know the person's coming to clean the house. You got to keep your house clean every day. That's hard for me. Um, but that's the metaphor for always being ready. And, uh, and so being watchful is much more than a once a year looking for wars and rumors of war. Being watchful is um, being prepared, is being always ready. So the command is clear, I'm at the bottom of page nine. Watch, watch out, keep watching. <laughs> uh, when you see these things um, and you, you do not expect these things, watch out that no one deceives you. Uh, you will know because you have been paying attention. Paying attention is an aspect of watching. Is this a personal command or a population command? Personal or population. population. So um, I'm not familiar with the term population. Maybe it means a community command. But um, what I think Jesus is saying to the specific disciples who asked him is personal. 
But what I think in the recording of this and the canonizing of the scripture is that it becomes a communal command. That as people who call ourselves Christians, not just the early disciples, this is what we're supposed to do. Does that address your question? Okay. So, um, you will know because you have been watching for the signs. The signs are not pretty. Um, and when you see all these things, you will know. And that is why to keep watch. Lightning from the east is visible even in the west. Vultures point to a carcass. This is a series of signs that, that Jesus is trying to say, you guys know when something's coming. Here's all the earthly ways. Um, except the waters of the flood came unexpectedly. And one man disappearing from the field. Um, and the faithful servant whose master comes when not expected. The antidote to that is to always be expectant. And to always be watching. And so um, I just pulled this chapter out. Um, it is part, I think it, part of it appears in every lectionary year, I think, for Advent. Um, because it has such rich imagery of um, expectation. Um, keep watch, like people looking at the fig tree. Keep watch for the flood, even though you can't see it coming. Keep watch in the field, faithfully. Um, keep watch over the future, looking for signs. Um, so watching for signs of things to come means that Advent is marked by a spirit of expectation. Um, I'm always reminded of that song from West Side Story. Um, something's coming, something good. Uh, I can feel it just around the corner. Uh, I think Maria sings it. And... Um, and it's, it's a song of anticipation and expectation. And um, of course that story doesn't end well, but the song is beautiful. And, um, and, and Maria in, that, in singing that song reflects the spirit of preparation and of longing. Um, there is a yearning from deliverance from the evils of the world, first expressed by the Israelite slaves in Egypt as they cried out from bitter oppression. It is the cry of those who have experienced the tyranny of injustice in a world under the curse of sin, and yet who have hope of deliverance by a God who has heard the cries of the oppressed slaves and brought deliverance. The same God that says, I have heard, I have seen, I have truly seen the oppression of my people before he makes the great exodus out of Egypt. That same God is saying in the person of Christ, I have heard, I have seen, I have truly seen the oppression of my people, not only 2,000 years ago when Christ was born, but even to this day. Uh, God knows what's going on. And God is in the business of delivering and redeeming and our job is to, to actively anticipate that. And one way of active anticipation, and I think this is the irony of it, so I hope you don't think I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. Um, we have to watch, even if we can't really see the signs. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll put it to you this way. I was in the marching band in high school and college, seen lots of football games. Uh, my oldest son, who's now 21, started playing football at age seven or nine. And then my second son played football. And, uh, but, and, and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan by marriage. Football is a big part of our culture. I've done a lot to, to immerse myself in that football culture. I've even mastered hosting a tailgate. But, and I watch the games that I go to. But I really don't understand a thing. I mean, and, and this is not a secret. My children know this. Uh, one time, we were at the collegiate football field, which is like half grass, half astroturf or something. It's a nice field. It has cement stand. Compared to the usual peewee football, it was a nice place. And it was some kind of playoff game. And my son, who had only ever played cornerback, 
which I had to learn was not quarterback. And I also had to learn cornerback was a defensive position. He only ever played defense. Okay. I looked away, I talked to a friend, I said hello to some grandmother of a person, on, I don't know what I did. I looked back and my son is on the field. And I yelled, go defense! I, I think that time he was in as a running back. I, I don't even know. All I know is he so heard me and he knew it was me and my ignorance of football was showing. But I still watch. I may not know what all the signs and signals mean. My husband's favorite is, is I, I don't even know what the real call is, because I call it illegal roughage. <laughs> and he goes, what is that, too much lettuce on the field? Um, I don't understand the signs and the symbols. I mean, I get touched down, but, but, um, but still I watch. And I think that's the encouragement from Jesus, the command from Jesus is, no, the, the flood is going to come no matter how hard you're looking. And you're probably not going to see it. But you still have to watch. Because your son is playing football. And uh, so, I, I think it's a paradoxical, but I think it's important that we be watchful. And I look forward to next week when we take up what it means to wait. Thank you.